the Great Migration. When we talk about the Great Migration, um, it's hard not to, it's, it's, it's hard to really encapsulate it in terms of its size. Um, the Great Migration was one of the largest mass migrations in global history. It was one of the largest movements, certainly one of the largest movements in peacetime, or at least in terms of the, without sort of a forced migration. It was one of the largest migrations in world history. Um, and if you look back at uh, census data going back to say before 1910, consistently 90% of African Americans lived in the South. Um, if you went to New York, for instance, in say 1840, you might find a rather sizable um, African American population, but it would be nothing compared to the, the African American population in northern cities after the Great Migration. So when we talk about these moments in time in the United States, we have to understand that most African Americans lived in the South prior to 1910. The, the, the diaspora, the movement out of the South and across the United States is really a post-1910 phenomenon. Um, what motivated this migration? Well, there were, were a number of things which motivated this migration. Usually it is um, attributed to worsening economic conditions in the South, and that's true. Um, uh, sharecropping, for instance, had, had really kind of run its course, at, certainly for African Americans in the South, at least being seen as a potential vehicle towards any sort of personal wealth. Uh, remember, sharecropping comes in really, say, 1870s, 1860s, 1870s, as a kind of compromise between having African Americans actually get land that probably was their due after slavery, and having some sort of system to, to perhaps work to gain land that was still in the hands of um, former slaveholders. So sharecropping had kind of failed as a system for African Americans, and many African Americans started looking for work elsewhere. Now, that might have been true before 1910, but those opportunities were not open elsewhere. Um, and also, transportation was still difficult before 1910. Yes, there were trains, and yes, there were means of um, moving around, but there was, not, there was not that kind of uh, critical mass of transportation alternatives, economic opportunity um, in the North, and uh, sort of just the complete failure of sharecropping to provide for African-American families in the South. There were other reasons, though, too. There, the reason why it occurs during the decade of um, the 19-teens, or at least begins in that decade, can be, can be connected to World War I as well. Let's look at um, W.E.B. Du Bois's um, article, uh, Returning Soldiers, written in May 1919, referring to African-American soldiers who had gone over to Europe during World War I and were now returning. We're now returning in uniform. And I won't um, read the entire thing, but Du Bois, um, this is a very strident and quite pointed critique of the United States from the perspective, really, of what it would have been like for a returning soldier. He says, today we return, we return from the slavery of uniform, which the world's madness demanded us to don to the freedom of civil garb. We stand again to look America squarely in the face and call a spade a spade. We sing this country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamed is yet a shameful land. It lynches. And lynching is barbarism of a degree of contemptible nastiness unparalleled in human history. It disenfranchises its own citizens, encourages ignorance, it steals from us. He goes on and on about all the ways that American society has prevented African Americans, specifically in the South, from having opportunity. And that Du Bois says really in this piece, we're not gonna stand for it as we return back to the home front. As we come back home, these soldiers are not going to, are not gonna stand for this type of treatment. And many soldiers do not. Um, one common story of soldiers coming back home to the South is finding that they come home to 
the racist community that they left, expecting that wearing the uniform of the United States would give them some sort of respect in the community. It certainly gives them respect uh, from their family and from their peers. But from the white citizens of the town, it, it actually, to a certain extent, white citizens get angry at the aspect of having a black soldier to a certain extent demand respect because of that uniform. And you find these altercations over uniforms um, or these altercations over returning black soldiers um, would flare up. There would be, there was a riot in Galveston after the war. And so you have these, um, this kind of unrest that occurs as many of these black soldiers come home. And many African-Americans make the decision, look, this, the South has no opportunity for me. Um, this Jim Crow South is not going to provide for my family in the future, and it's time to leave. In the migrate in the 1910 to 1920, this is just a 1910 to 1920 period. Over half a million African Americans leave the South, um, and they leave. As I went through, they leave because of the Jim Crow laws, the lack of opportunity, the police state that existed in the South. They leave because sharecropping offers nothing, and they leave because of the economic opportunity up north. Here is a, a map from the US Census Bureau detailing, you can see the movement from the south to the north just in the period between 1910 and 1940. It's estimated that 1.6 million, I believe that was a number I saw somewhere else anyway, um, 1.6 million African Americans leave in that period. And then there's a second great migration which also goes to the Northern United States, but also goes out West to California, um, which takes place roughly between 1940 and 1970. So we have these two great migration. And in that great migration, 5 million African-Americans leave the South. So all told, you're talking about a massive um, movement of uh, people, African-Americans who had largely lived in the South before 1910. And then that kind of, that kind of reverses um, in the next 60 years. Some of the things that we see after, um, that are, that happened during the Great Migration and can be seen as a reason for the Great Migration and at the same time as, to a certain extent, as a result of the Great Migration, or at least as a result of increased African-American mobility and prosperity outside of the immediate South, would be what happens in Tulsa in 1921. In recent years, this massacre has uh, gained more attention, um, largely because um, it had been really written out of history for the previous, say, 90 years. Um, in 1921, the, the business district, the Black business district of Tulsa was one of the wealthiest um, African-American business districts in the country. It was called Black Wall Street. You had African-Americans who found some sort of economic opportunity in Tulsa and really started to, and remember, T Oklahoma is not exactly um, the West and it's not exactly the South. It is a place, it was not involved in the Civil War, at least directly, it was not even a state. Oklahoma used to be called Indian Territory on US maps. Um, and in Tulsa, African Americans who at some previous point may have left the South uh, found some sort of opportunity. It was called in the years afterwards a race riot. Um, there are some theories that the reason why Tulsa, the Tulsa, the authorities call it a riot was so that insurance companies, insurance companies wanted it to be called a riot because they did not want it to be called a massacre because then they would have to pay out claims that many African Americans had. They held insurance. And so um, it really was a massacre. Um, it was spurred by one of these small incidents that often happened in the South in which um, a, a white woman on an elevator accused a black man of some sort of indiscretion. It's really not clear um, what exactly happened, if anything. This snowballed into um, days of white, the white citizens of Tulsa, many of them, uh, some of them, excuse me, um, actually hunting down um, black families and, and murdering 100 to 300 um, African Americans, many of whom um, were buried in unmarked graves, and the exact extent uh, 
of the death and destruction is not really known. What we do know is that the entire black business district was burned to the ground, really ending and or, you know, coming to an end um, this African-American prosperity in this particular town. And the event is then written out of history. So we see during the Great Migration, this is not, this is not the only aspect of the Great Migration that, 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 that it's not as if the Great Migration ended with this, but we see that this movement out of the South um, is done for this very reason, for not only this, this sort of, of violence that's visited upon African-Americans in the South and elsewhere, where, and many of them start to move north for economic opportunity, thinking, well, I, we can't even find opportunity in the West, in Oklahoma. Um, we have to move to these northern cities. Um, but you also see this, um, that, that African-Americans, not only during the war, but also after the war, start to feel that their destiny does not lie in these communities, in these racist communities in the South, in which, um, in which events like this could occur. What is the overall legacy of the migration? There are many. Most importantly, um, many, this is, if you have 90% of African Americans living in the agrarian South before 1910, and then that being flipped on its head in the subsequent decades, most African Americans in the North are living in an urban environment. Um, and in living in an urban environment, um, you have the, pop the African American population of northern cities such as Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, sort of skyrockets during this period of time. The New York City black population, for instance, between 1910 and 1930 grows by 2.5 times, 257%. Harlem um, is completely transformed by this. Um, one point, and we have these stats that I gave you before, the 1.6 million that leave between 1910 and 1940. Perhaps one of the most important um, aspects of the Great Migration, which we should understand, especially for as we go forward in learning about United States history and as we go forward learning about the Civil Rights era, is that the movement of African Americans from the South to Northern cities would have a great effect on the civil rights movement. Remember, in the South, African Americans largely were prevented from voting through Jim Crow laws. When African Americans move to the North, they do have the ability to vote. They are, I mean, there is discrimination, there is racism, don't get me wrong, in the North, but there is the opportunity as populations move to the North to have political power. And you start to see the first Black congressman elected, and you start to see um, at least first black congressman after Reconstruction elected, start to be elected in the North, and, and also politicians in the North that even white politicians who have black constituencies start to respond to moving into the post-World War II period. Um, and one thing that you can see quite clearly in American history is that the Democratic Party, for instance, which had been a part, been, at least in the South, a segregationist racist party um, um, before World War, World War II, starts to be transformed during the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, into also, it also has a large constituency of urban voters. These are immigrants, African Americans in the North and others. Um, and so you have a strange party that kind of moves into the 1930s, which is, has part of its constituency as sort of white Southerners, the, the solid South of the Democratic Party, um, who largely consists of white Southerners in the South. And then you have um, a much more diverse coalition of voters in the North. That coalition, that weird coalition, is what gets Franklin Delano Roosevelt elected. And then you start to see the Democratic Party grow in power um, through FDR's four terms as president. And then once you get into the 1950s, um, you start to see the beginning of the end of that Southern segregationist Democratic Party. In fact, the, the Southern Democrats really lose almost all of their power 
by the 1980s. And you see the Republican Party largely become the dominant party in the American South by the 1980s, 1990s, and, and beyond. Um, and that has a lot to do with that many African Americans who, after the civil rights movement, do now have the opportunity to vote in the South. Well, there's many, much fewer African Americans in the South after the Great Migration. And many of them, many of them have, and their, um, and their families have moved to the North and West. And that's where you start to see the power of the Democratic Party, this new Democratic Party, um, which is largely a function of the, uh, the, the urban sort of Democratic Party. That's where it starts to gr grow strength in the 1950s and afterwards. And much of the civil rights movement, many of the actions of the civil rights movement and many civil rights organizations are actually funded and supported and many civil rights actions are begun by African Americans in the North who turn their attention to the South and seek to help African Americans in the South get under, get out from under the yoke of Jim Crow. Um, and we'll see this phenomena, uh, you see this phenomena in things like the Emmett Till case in the 1950s. You see this phenomena in um, groups like a CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. You see this in the uh, uh, freedom, um, the, 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 the sort of freedom summer and sort of many of these other civil rights actions in the 1950s and 60s in which African Americans in the North um, are coming down South and trying to affect change in the South where their parents and grandparents and great grandparents um, hailed from. 